Saturday is back to three three sessions a day, Jesus two Christ. runs in gym, and then a Sunday's long run day. So get up in the morning, do a long run, and then get to mass. Get to <laughs> mass. <laughs> so try to get it all wrapped up so we can get to mass. That is like a very wholesome end to a to a hard to week a of training week. as yeah. well. Yeah. Play by play on Sports Joe and Her, brought to you by AIG in support of Twenty by Twenty. Fresh from the World Athletics Championships in Doha, Kira McGeehan is here. Kira, welcome to Play by Play. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much for coming in. Uh, a record-breaking return to Ireland. You finished 10th in the 1500, running a personal best as well. Why not throw it in while you can? How has it been since you've come back? Oh, it's been amazing. I have to say, I've been completely blown away with everything since coming home. Mm. People's responses to my, to my racing and to my interviews, it's... Is giving me a right laugh because I didn't really think anybody was was watching it quite as much as they were. So, do you know what? I've I'm I'm taken aback by it all, and I'm just so grateful for everybody's support. Really, yeah, a lot of people were watching that. We're going to talk about that kind of post match interview in a little bit as well. But I want to talk about the race itself for a minute first. So, kind of yeah. talk us through it. Yeah. So, well, even just to set up that race is probably. I'm pretty sure it's the fastest race ever, 1500 meter female history. Wow. Um, Hassan ran 351, which puts her fourth in the all time list, yeah. which is just, it's, it's unbelievable. Um, fourth place ran 354. Yeah. So that's, that's crazy. Like somebody had told me a stat that my time of four flat 15 would have won seven out of the past eight world championships. Would have won it. Yeah. Wow. So I know that's given that championships are tactical. So, you know, yeah. that kind of comes into, into a factor. But that, that race that panned out was just, um, it, was, it was unbelievable. It really was. And I was very shocked whenever I came off. I didn't see the time until yeah. um, one of the journalists, Cahill, told me that Sifan Hassan had ran 3.51. Well, it was. I was going to ask, like, because during a race like that, are you aware of the pace in terms of, you know, th the past races that you run? Or, like, I know that when you came off, you, you didn't even know that that was... A baby. It, yeah, <laughs> you, did, you didn't even know that. So are you aware of, of how fast a race is while you're running it? You definitely are. Like mm. there's clocks all around the yeah. track so we can see our splits if we if we want to look sideways at this clock that sits in it's in our line of vision. Um, if you don't want to look at it, you don't have to look at it. Yeah. But um, I was look, aware. Though? So I, I knew what the pace went through. We went through 400 and I was kind of like, OK, this is this is OK. And then Sifan went round the, sort of the side and I, I literally was like, right. Buckle up. Yeah. I'm in for a fast one because she's I knew if Sifan was going to the front that it was going to take the pace was going to pick up. So after that I didn't look at the clock because I just knew I just have to hold on to that grip and stay stay yeah. there. Don't lose that don't lose touch with them. Um so I didn't look at the clock because I knew I was going close to my max, which I did, I ended up running a PB. Yeah. So yeah, sometimes you look at the clock, sometimes you don't. It gives you a rough gauge if if you're looking for a particular time. But come championship running, it's all about position, it's all about race and the race yeah. in front of you. So um yeah. You know, you know when it's fast, you feel it in your in your body. <laughs> and I mean, like what goes through your mind in terms of the mentality of it? Like when you said when you saw Safan go, you were just like, right, well, that's, you know, she's going to go off. That's going to be fast. I is there a moment of panic or do you have processes in your brain that you go through that kind of just be like, don't panic, keep keep running my race? That's exactly it. You, yeah. Like I whenever I said I. I, before each race, I write down what I think the race is going to pan out like, and I'll have a couple of different race scenarios and how I would race according to each scenario. So I think that's something that, that really gives me peace of mind going into the race. And it also gives me that opportunity to have a plan as soon as something pans out. So I feel quite ready. Um, so whenever I saw Sifan going around, I did think, oh, bleep. <laughs> it was, uh, I knew that that was going to go fast and I knew that Sifan was capable of running a time that I'm not capable of running at right right now. So um, so that's where the, the logic of, of my race and mind has to come in where I say, okay, this pace is going to go hard yeah. and it may go harder than I'm able to do. If I had went with her pace from the start, I wouldn't have finished where I finished. I would have blown up. So you have to be smart in that and I had to get my tactics right. So I knew to, to try to stay touch with that grip and that the girls were running very fast. And it's managing those doubts in your head because I did think, oh no, you're just going to get left behind. And silencing that little silence in that little voice that's telling you that negative. Whereas yeah. I just, it did come in, and I'm I have to say I'm very happy and proud of the way I managed it in my head because I went no, you're going to race the race that's there. You're going to run as hard as you can. That was your plan coming in, and I executed it. And to run a PB in a final like you, you've I gave everything I had out there. I battled yeah. right to the line, 
And um, yeah, I, I was a little disappointed. Uh, I'm not going to lie, that you part of me. You were disappointed yeah. with uh, PB. Yeah, well, like in the sense that I, I, was, I was disappointed come 10th. Right. And, and that's the racer in me and that's the yeah. athlete in me. And if somebody had told me you'll come 10th at the beginning of the year with PB, I would have taken their hand off. But mm. stepped off that track with a great sense of pride yeah. and, and I was very happy, but a little bit of... Right. I want I want to be further up. Yeah, I mean like you said you said yourself there that in terms of that kind of pack that were, you know, out the front that are sub four, you know, like that you know yourself that you're not able to attain that at the moment, yes. Um is that frustrating for you, like when you're training? Because if you look back to say 2016, for example, like, and you can see how much you've progressed, it's it's there, the work is paying off, which I'm imagining is incredible to see. But it's so tedious and like, you know, for like the shaving of a second here or that, like, is that frustrating for you then to see, you know, 351, for example, just just there as in, you know, where you want to get to be? Oh, definitely. Yeah. It definitely is. I, whenever it was, it was a bittersweet moment stepping off the track because I gave absolutely everything. Mm. And um, and yeah, it was hard because I, I walked straight out and I met my coach and I gave him a hug and, and I did say to him, I was like... Steve, what do you have to do yeah. to get there? Now, I know that in the shape that I'm in, I could have ran sub four. Um, I'm very happy to have run literally so close to four minutes mm. flat, having run two races prior. If I if I was in a race that was paced and I, I know that I could go under four minutes, I could maybe run uh, a 3.58. I feel like I'm in that kind of shape. And that's so exciting. And it's it's a really good feeling to have that mm. I know that I'm able to do it. It didn't come out this season, but I know it's there. Um, whenever you see something like 351, that's, I'm not, I never will say, and I'll never put myself down, but I'm a realistic person that I will never achieve 351 in my lifetime. That time is fourth in the all time list. It's something that most athletes will never touch on. And yeah. it's, it's something that there's a question mark over um, for a lot of people. So that's um, that's tough, yeah. and that's tough for me to feel to to feel um, stepping off the track. But then I look at that race and I see girls who came fourth, right. uh, American girl Shelby, who I watched cool down. She had tears in her eyes coming fourth in three fifty four. Yeah. But I was like, Shelby, you ran three fifty four. Yeah, that that in itself is a life achievement mm. that you should be extremely proud of. Now to miss out on a medal and run that fast is ridiculous. Mm. But um, but I know whenever I see those athletes, I'm like, well, I can achieve that. Yeah, I can run what Jenny Simpson ran. I can run what Shelby ran. Yeah. and that gives me a lot of. A lot of excitement and a lot mm. of faith because I, I believe in those athletes and I believe that they're they're no better than me. Yeah. And that with that little bit of extra extra work and just not even extra work, extra consistency. Mm. I joined my team in Manchester two years ago and I've made such leaps and bounds between then and now. Yeah. So it's exciting to see what will happen in the next year, the next two years, the next Olympic cycle as yeah. well. Um it's an exciting place to be and I feel like I can make that progression and and make it to the sub four club. <laughs> yeah, the sub four club. I mean, in terms of that, you were kind of saying it there, you know, for athletes who are, who are hitting these times. And is it difficult to not look back at history when you're comparing times constantly? You know, like the way you said that with your time, it would have won, you know, seven or eight world championships at a certain period of time. Um, you know, the way that your sport is progressing to have somebody run, you know, 351, like it, it obviously is progressing at, at an incredible pace. Honorific. Um <laughs> but like is it hard to kind of compare yourself to the athletes gone by yeah like I suppose it's it's something that I've said I was like like the ladies um 1500 meters is one of the hottest events in athletics right now and it's really shifted and come on come on like absolutely amazingly and mm. I could look at it and say oh my goodness I'm so unfortunate to be born into an era of such fantastic 1500 meter running mm. Or I can look at it, at it as an honour. I'm one of them and yeah. I'm also racing with them. And, and, I, and I look at it that way because there's no point in dwelling on the negative. Like, yeah, if I was born in another generation, maybe I could have, I definitely think I could quite likely have placed higher than 10th in that world champs, being the chance to medal in some years. Yeah. But this is racing and, and I feel very lucky. I raced the race in Monaco where Sifan ran the world record. Mm. To be in a race where somebody runs a world record is a fantastic honour and that I competed there and that I'm I'm toeing the line next to these girls and to be able to show young Irish girls that yeah. listen we can be among the best in the world and, and I'm constantly striving I want to be the best in the world if I can be and and to do the very best that I can and it's 
Yeah, I think you just have to rise to that challenge and to that occasion. And I look at it as, as just that a challenge. I want to try to get myself as close to that top place finish as I can. Well, in terms of that, let's move on to talk a little bit about your training regime. I can't even imagine. I'm, I'm exhausted thinking about it. Um, but you're taking a break now for a little while. You, you came back into Dublin and uh, you're taking a break before you go back to, to Manchester. And obviously Tokyo is there and we're going to talk about that a little bit as well. But what is your average training day like? Um, so it really depends throughout the week. I have a few key sessions, so mm. um, I can give you a quick run through a normal week because some days are very similar. Um, my coach usually has Monday as, as an easy day, oh. so I'll only have to run for about six, seven miles that day. So that's my easy day run nice. um, with a couple of strides maybe. So that's the one run day and I get to have a lie-in. I'm allowed to lie-in that day. Um, Tuesday on a is Monday as on well. a Monday. It's a beautiful thing. But as an athlete, no day is the beginning of the week and no day is the end of the yeah, week. So I don't really have holidays. I don't have weekends. It just is a continuous circle. Yeah. So um, so yeah, Monday is is nice. Um, Tuesday is a key session day where I'll do a workout in the morning or in the evening. So that'll be a double 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 run day. I'll run one run of 30 minutes and then one, one hard session. Mm -hmm. um, Wednesday is the tough day. I have two runs and a gym session. So three sessions that day. So that's pretty tiring. Yeah. Um, and we often end up fitting in physio as well or some sort of treatment. Thursday is one run day. And we all love a Thursday because it comes <laughs> after that tough three day day. Yeah. Um, so I'll have one, one run of an hour or 70 minutes. And then the following day is another session day. So two runs, one session and a run. Yeah. Um, and then Saturday is back to three, three sessions a day. Jesus two Christ. runs in gym. And then a Sunday's long run day. So get up in the morning do a long run, and then get to Mass. Get to <laughs> Mass! So, try to get it all wrapped up so we can get to Mass. That is like a very wholesome end to a, to a hard to week a of training week. as yeah. well. Yeah. Absolutely, I wasn't expecting that one. Yeah. Um, My mommy's happy whenever I'm like, I got to Mass today, mommy. It's, it's all good, I enjoy it. And there's a lovely wee man that I meet in the chapel. We light candles next to each other whenever. Oh, I'm not, I don't get to Mass absolutely every week. I'm not yeah. going to... I'm not going to make myself out to be yeah, absolutely fantastic, but I try my best. Just run straight to the church yeah, as well. So you need yeah, all the candles you can get. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Um, it's so vigorous, the training that you do, obviously, and it's obviously all to kind of, you know, continue to progress. But how do you deal with, you know, little niggles and kind of the injury concerns that might come down? Because I know, you know, in 2016 in Rio, you were coming off the back of like some severe injury uh, and things have been going well for you, though, you know, since, since yeah. then. Touch wood, let's, where's the wood under here? Um, Touch all the wood. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like, I mean, how do you kind of manage that? Because presumably that happens, obviously, when you're, when you're training to that level as well, at, at such an elite level. Definitely. Like, there's so many ups and downs in sport as there are in every aspect mm. of life. And the simple ones are something like I have a niggle yeah. and I have an injury. And quite often getting an injury is nearly the easiest because it's a real physical thing. You go see a physio, you go see the doctor, they give you uh, prescribed exercises to do and it's really manageable and it's really objective. Yeah. The harder ones are whenever you have nearly an unexplained poor performance or you're extremely tired or you're not quite sure what the reason is why things aren't going well and that's much more subjective and that's yeah. quite hard to get your head around. So for me, 2017 was a year where I was training really well and not racing so well and some races would be brilliant and some would be real poor. Yeah. And that was nearly the hardest year for me. That was tougher than coming back from my ankle surgery that saw me out of the sport for two or three years. Yeah. That was a tough time, but I was constantly making progress and I was constantly doing rehab and I felt like I was on an upward tangent. Whereas yeah. whenever it's going hard performance wise, sometimes you just feel at a loss. So for me, 2017 was a big year. I also had a really hard year where I DNF'd in uh, European Indoor Champs, which means you, I did not finish. Yeah. And that was heartbreaking for me. And I had a really tough time after that. And actually, I was working really closely with my physio, who was in the Institute at the time, Emma Gallivan. And Emma, anybody who knows physios, I was only listening to your to you previously, and you're like, physios are like psychologists. Yes, that's what Jenny was saying. Yeah, yeah like and, doubled as a psychiatrist. Yeah, and yeah. I was watching that thinking, you're so spot on. Like, yeah. physios are an all encompassing um, treatment, especially for athletes. Like, people open up whenever they're on the physio bed, and, and they're in such a vulnerable position. And quite often, the physio is the person who sees them at their most vulnerable. And yeah. Emma, after that race in Belgrade, um, was like, look, here, I'm a wee bit. 
we were worried about you. Are you feeling okay? I was go- heading off to a training camp and she was concerned I was going to be all on my own. And my boyfriend was gone, but I didn't have any supports with me. Yeah. And um, so she put me in touch with the sports psychologist in the Institute, Kate right. Kirby. And I started working with Kate. And that's something that I find has been so helpful mm. because I feel that... As athletes, we work, look after absolutely everything. Like I'm training, as you said, a really rigorous training yeah. regime. I work on my recovery. I'm concerned about sleep, my diet, everything. Mm. But for some reason, we sometimes miss that mental aspect. Mental and mm. it's not only performance related, it's life. Yeah. And we're not robots. So I started working with Kate and that really helped me. And my own coach now, Steve, I moved to Manchester. Steve Vernon has such... Uh, an active role in he believes that our mentality has such a role in our performance and he works really closely to help me as an athlete and as a person and I feel like that aspect really helped me deal with those ups and those downs be it an injury or an eagle or unexplained performance and um, and it's something that I think everybody should should address whether you're an athlete or Mm. or just a a person out working because Oh, it's, it's so tough. We look after ourselves physically. We should also look after ourselves mentally. It's kind of ironic that we're talking today because it is World Mental Health Day yeah. as well like that. But I feel like sometimes it's like we were talking about a niggle or an injury that might, you know, push you over the edge to, to think about everything, to not just think about like, I find sometimes and I've interviewed athletes before who've been like, you know, why am I doing this? Why am I putting myself through all of this mm-hmm. pain? And yeah. sometimes the payoff is there and sometimes the payoff isn't there. But it's sometimes when they get pushed back or they get a knock or they get an injury or something happens in their personal life that it really makes them think about. And and sometimes the reaction is, I'll get back training mm-hmm. straight away. And sometimes that's not the way to kind of deal with it. Sometimes it is yeah. about... It's about addressing it. Like yeah. that's um, that's one thing that I've worked with Steve a lot on is is not pushing stuff under, under the rug. Yeah. Like... Uh, a perfect example is me going into a race. I used to be extremely nervous and I dreaded race day. Really? I still am. Oh my goodness, you should see me race so day. So is that um, before the actual race or is it the whole lead up the night before? Oh, the night before. You can't sleep very well. I can't really eat because I'm so nervous. Yeah. got butterflies in my tummy. And it's a whole, the whole uh, like parasympathetic nervous system is going mental like I'm I've got shakes and I'm yeah, I'm really? so nervous and and it's it's quite funny I, I laugh at it myself because I can't stop my body feeling that way yeah. but how I interpret it um can be can be deemed positive so I try to switch it all to the positive yeah. and it's something that I work with Steve with very well and and as you had said we can we can try to just be rash and go and oh no I have to deal with this yeah. so me me in a previous um life would have went I'm just going to ignore that and not not have even spoken about it. But it's good to speak about your fears. Yeah. So I would talk to my coach and he's like, well, and I was like, oh, my goodness. So what are you worried about? I was like, I'm worried about trailing out last. Yeah. And talking it and verbalizing it. Saying and it out. Yeah. And Steve's like, right, well, why do you think you'll trail out last? And I'm like, because whatever happened in one race. And he's like, right, when was that? And I was like, three years ago. And he's like, OK, have you has that happened since? No. And how's your training been going? Good. And what about those past three races? Where did you finish? Yeah, I finished well. So, so logically, yeah, that's not going to happen. Now, obviously, there's always a chance in life that something will happen. He's like, but let's look at this logically. It's a and smart man. Address, yeah, and it's and he's given me the tools as well. Like I think a good coach often makes themselves redundant. Yeah. So he's he's given me all the tools to be able to deal with my my mental nervousness, my mental anxiety around races or anything like that, and and it works with life too. Like yeah. if you have an issue, it's not good to just ignore it, and and it's something that the lessons I've learned in sport will, will go forward and I'll take them into every aspect yeah. of my life. And yeah, on World Mental Health Day, it's it's really good like for people to get out and talk yeah. and be it to a professional or a friend or some family. Sometimes actually just saying it yourself, you don't yeah. need advice. No. The words come out of your head and you go, oh, wasn't that ridiculous? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> or just come in here, have a chat, have a chat with yeah. us on, on Play by Play, get it all out. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the post-match interview that you did like right after you came off um, in Doha because, you know, that that blew up and we were kind of talking a little bit there before, you know, we, we came on camera and you said yourself, you know, that athletics isn't necessarily the most popular sport. But people, I think, were so drawn to that interview. I think it was because of how open you were and we discussed it on the show here with Jenny. Um, we were talking about it and how sometimes athletes can be quite guarded. Now, I mean imagine the things that are going through your head like mm-hmm. it can be a number of different reasons why sometimes yeah. I just don't want to talk to journalists fair we get it um but I mean did you kind of 
were you surprised by the reaction to like how big that interview actually kind of it just went viral like. oh my goodness I was so surprised really? I, so I, I kind of look at my social media a little bit but I tend to stay slightly askew of it and yeah. look at it from afar and but I had like my my siblings message me my little, my little brother shared a tweet um, saying, oh, my sister's a legend or something like that. And he was like, oh, my God, my Twitter feed is hitting up. Yeah. And I, it had like 5,000 likes. I couldn't believe it. I was like, and 200 odd reshares. I was like, just people are, this is, yeah. this is, I've never experienced this before. I've been completely blown away. And like, I have to say thank you to the whole Irish public. Like they, mm. they gave me such a lift while I was out there. It was something special. But yeah, I was so surprised. And I like, as you said, I'd seen your interview and because you's, uh, you's flattered me so much saying you's had like a night out with me. Oh, I was yeah. like, oh, geez, lads. Mom, We're like pure crack. That's mom, it. Mom, <laughs> like, we'll, we'll have the banter. But I've been guilty in the past of being one of those athletes that has been quite guarded. And yeah. and I felt that maybe, maybe it is with maturity that I've realized like I'm, I love my sport and nobody can tell me that I'm not taking myself professionally or I'm not invested enough or I don't care enough about it because they don't know me. And if they were ever going to doubt that, well, that's up to them to doubt yeah. because I know what I, I'm doing and I invest in it. And to come off the, the track, I was like, look, life's too short yeah. to, to, to try to be this, this thing that I'm not. And like anybody who does know me, I'm up for the crack. It can be quiet and grumpy at times, but, but I, Look, I think it showed how much I was loving it out there. You and were how happy. Much, it really came yeah. across. You were just like, you were buzzing. Like the love for my sport. And that's something that I want people to see. And like it's, whenever you see somebody who's so passionate, it's palpable. And yeah. and look, I was just over the moon. I'm thank, thanking the lucky stars I didn't swear because <laughs> my mummy would have had a conniption. But like it's, um, yeah, it's it's blown me away with the sheer support from it. And uh, hopefully, hopefully it drew a few people into the into the world champs to cheer uh, on the Irish. Absolutely, yeah. And I mean, as well as that, I'm going to quote you directly now. So you said, like, for a wee girl from Port of Ferry, that's not too bad at all. And I think like everybody just was googling Port of Ferry <laughs> and just trying to find out more about like this this incredible athlete. Um, but I suppose looking back a little bit, like growing up, um, it wasn't always running for you, wasn't it? Like you come from a very Gaelic. Yeah, Family. big big GA background. Like I, anybody who Googled Port of Ferry, they'll find out that it's in the back or so nowhere. Usually, <laughs> like we're quite far away from everything, and it's quite a, it's a rural community. And I'm an hour from Belfast, so yeah. I had to travel an hour to get to the track whenever I took up athletics. Um, so I absolutely love the town I'm from. I'm so proud to be from Port of Ferry, mm. and uh, I grew up playing camogie. Yeah. Um, my family, you're a big GA family. My whole family, both sides, played for our local club. And didn't your aunt get an all star? Didn't she? Nominated she was nominated for, for, for an all star. So. Like, that's it. My, my Aunt Adele was my idol growing up. She was the person I wanted to be. And people are like, who were your heroes whenever you were younger? Mines were all Kamugi players. Yeah. Um, and like, not even not even the big stars that were on the Kilkenny and the Cork teams. Mm. And mines were my aunt who played for, for Down and then transferred and played for Antrim. And uh, and, and a Kamug from Leitrim, Maureen McAleen, and I played against her. I watched her play, the yeah. skill that she had. I I absolutely loved these ladies and I, I watched them with awe and I wanted to do that. I wanted to win an All-Ireland medal for my club, an All-Ireland mm. medal for County. I wanted to have an All-Star. It's still in my dreams. Yeah. Maybe I'll go back when I retire from athletics. Why not? If somebody will take me, I'm sure the <laughs> club will take me back. But um, yeah, I grew up playing camogie. I didn't do athletics and, and my passion was always on the camogie field. Yeah. Um, and I swore I wasn't going to give it up. Athletics was going to be kicked to the curb. Really? Until then I realised the, the potential I had in athletics and that... For me, the big decider was that I could represent Ireland mm. at the highest level. And, and, and was it literally just like a, cr a cross-country type schools event that, that people started to go, oh, whoa, there's Kirk and Ron? Yeah. Or it, like, how exactly did it come about? So I think I've always been that little girl that never stopped. I was yeah. always the one playing football with the boys at lunchtime and absolutely loved sports day. And I ran two small cross-country races in primary school um, up in Yutnards. But like that, was, that wasn't anything much. And whenever I went to secondary school in Assumption in Ball on the Hinch, my, uh, my PE teacher was like, oh, she, she just never stops in PE. Would you like to try cross country? So I jumped at the chance of getting out of class and yeah. getting mucky. Me and my friend Nicola were like, let's get, get to it. So raced the, the districts in, in Delmont and I did fine. I didn't do too well. And mm. then I think it was third year that I won the districts out of the blue. Nobody was expecting it. The girl who came second was a well-known good runner yeah. who, who ran for, for Ulster and mm. had represented Northern Ireland. And, and I, I was like, oh, who's, they were like, who's this wee girl? So then I joined a coach 
the PE teacher asked me did I want to try track yeah. and and that's where it was all born really because I'm a much better track athlete than I am cross country so yeah. whenever I, I got onto that athletics track I think people realised that oh this wee girl can run. And this is where she's she might be meant to be yeah. Yeah and, and all spiralled from there really. Yeah. I, read a, I read a quote that you said once before that like the first kind of big competitive match that you played in you could taste blood in your mouth afterwards and you were you were fit to throw up um, that sounds absolutely awful like I mean so so <laughs> What was it that drew you into the sport more once you started realizing that you were getting good at? And then as well, like I suppose coming from Camogie, that's such a team mentality. And, you know, it could be said that that running is, you know, a lonely sport because you're obviously like just on your own. I mean, obviously there's teams involved, you know, when you're yeah, representing the country and stuff. But you're you're toe on the line yourself. Yeah. And even whenever it is a cross country event that there's a team involved, you're still an individual in that, yeah, in that exactly. race. And it is a very lonely sport. And that's something that I find hard at the start. Um, but even something that the the pros and the cons often are quite similar mm. in that something that's a pro is also a con. So that individuality that I felt I was on my own, I was just having a team around me and that passion of the whole team. Um, then it was just me. But equally, I, I'm a very aggressively competitive person yeah. and everything was in my control. So that was also a benefit. I, I felt that I wasn't I didn't have to rely on anybody else to tighten up their boots and, and pull their weight. Yeah. Because in the past, it probably would have been quite verbal. I have friends who, who close friends now. One of my friends, Kirsty, was like, you used to scare me when we played Kamugi. Oh, I, I kind of <laughs> get that, though, because when there's a team, like, you know, obviously it's it's great when everybody performs really well, but at times everybody doesn't perform really well. And I suppose yeah. when you're in an individual uh, sport, it's, it's you, and yeah. you have to take all of that responsibility, and you take all the good, and you also take all the, all the bad. So lonely, yes, but... But, but there comes a, it comes with a benefit yeah. that it's all in my control and I and I know and I don't have to rely on anybody else. So it is it is it's interesting. I think I just absolutely love that competitiveness of sport and I would have done any sport that I had a given been given the chance to do. There wasn't a lot in Portaferry. We're quite a small community and mm. we don't even have like Gaelic football in the club. We're just a hurling and camogie oh, nice. club. Um, and we have a soccer soccer team in the in the town and I Irish danced and I tap danced and I was in the drama. My granny Kathleen had us in everything but the crib. And we were actually in the crib because we were always in the nativity. So <laughs> so ultimately we did everything and yeah. um so as my a busy just, childhood, you were busy. going to a lot of different things. Yeah. Yeah. But that's that's lo local communities. And I mm. feel like that's the real Irish community that we're we're always involved in everything. You're always helping out. You say there's a bazaar, your granny has you off running, doing errands on that. And I used to collect parry straw and everything was a competition <laughs> for me. So maybe the chance just to get out and race was just another one. And yeah. it's hard. I'm still getting used to it in the sense that I still get extremely nervous. But yeah. I just love sport. <laughs> well, there you go. I mean, I suppose like coming back slightly to uh, to competitive racing now and that that pain and the blood, the taste of blood in your mouth. It's not actual blood, like just in case anybody's like, what? It's a bit what? of a or something. What are they talking <laughs> about? Yeah. Um, it's interesting because I've spoken to runners before and it's I always find it really interesting speaking to runners because I just I can't imagine like I ran for the Lewis earlier this morning and I literally nearly vomited I'm just not a good runner I think you're, you're either born to run or you're not but um I remember we, we spoke to Paula Radcliffe before and she gave us kind of this this tip that she used to do when she hit like that dark place of pain you know and I sp I heard you describe in the race um in Doha about like that last 300 meters and how it like really really hurts and she said that she counted she literally just counted to 100 and then she just started again and that was like how she got through that so do you have any kind of tips and tricks that you do mentally when you're getting to that point of just oh the darkness is coming in it's complete pain how can I get through it definitely like I my my moments of pain are much shorter than uh than Paula's yeah, because she's course. out there racing the marathon and you mm. can hit the wall at mile 19, 20, 21, yeah. 22. Kind of like it, it's pretty hard. Mm. Um, whereas mine's is in that last 200 meters, 150, 100. Yeah. Um, and definitely it's something that I practice in training. I have little cues in my head. So it might, might be a phrase just to remind me about my form. Sometimes I'm saying tap, 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 tap in my head, really? thinking of my feet going quick. Oh. Other times I'll be, I'll be maybe saying the word drive or it's whatever, something that's clicked with me at that, that particular time, maybe something I've practiced and I'm constantly saying that in my head. Yeah. And little words like that my coaches told me through the line. Yeah. These that come flashing into your head. And so it is. It's cues. Like it's words. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Just, to, just to remind. Because coming down that point where everything's absolutely hurting, you can lose your form. Yeah. And you can lose that nice running form, which jeopardizes your pace. Yeah. So for me to remind myself about 
the execution of my running is a key part. So it's something you have to practice as well. Like I practice that in training and my coach will tell me if I got sloppy at the end of a session, like you, you, you didn't try hard enough coming through there and you're like, oh, I was trying so hard. It's so but, connected though, isn't it? Like it's so connected to what you're saying in your brain to then almost just remind your body of the things that you have to do that yeah. you've trained for. Oh, and I do, I do every single day. So yeah. So it is hard. Sometimes you'll you'll fall into the into the trap of starting to lose your form a little, and and that's that's understandable. You're absolutely exhausted. But if you can try to maintain that perfect form, if you look at the world's best sprinters, mm. they nearly look like they're relaxed crossing the line. Their shoulders are relaxed, yeah. their arms are relaxed, and they're the ones moving fastest. So yeah, it takes practice, but it's definitely I give myself cues down that home straight every time. Okay, tap tap tap. I'm gonna <laughs> like I'm gonna take that on board. <laughs> On the way to the Lewis. The next time I'm running for the Lewis. Yeah, tap, 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 drive, drive. You can make it, you can make it. Um, it won't help me, but anyway. Um, so you are, like we said, you're taking a little break now and then it's back to training in Manchester. So tell us a little bit about what's coming next for you. So what do you have your sights set on? Obviously, Tokyo is there. Um, and yeah, what's, what's, what's the kind of head down situation for you yeah, now? Yeah, so, so I have a little break at the minute. Um, I'm... Um, between all of the different homes that I have Manchester's a home now yeah. Dublin's always a, a little home I studied here my boyfriend lives here all my friends there and then I'm going home home to Portofarrow which home. is always home home um, so I'll, I'll have I'll enjoy this break and then get ready the 2019 year isn't over just yet yeah. I have um, possibly European champs coming mm -hmm. up uh, in the cross so I'll decide with my coach if I'm going to race Euro cross um, and then after that yeah it's all prep and time for, for Rio so it's going to be Sorry, I have hair in my mouth. <laughs> You're just so excited to tell I'm us so what's excited. going on. Um, so next year, the, the plan's going to be that Tokyo is, yeah. the, um, is the big plan. Mm. Um, so my whole ra year is gearing up to that. Mm. So it's going to be a, a combination of racing and altitude training camps. Yeah. So I'm probably going to go to the US at the beginning of the year for an altitude camp, base myself there for a little bit of time, mm. do some races on the indoor circuit. Um, then... Yeah, keep driving forward. I'll come, come back to Manchester. Yeah. I'll have a little bit of, probably a little bit of downtime, not quite time off, but it's hard to constantly be at the top of the game. Yeah. So in order to peak, I'll probably come up, I'll come back down a little bit and then start mm. building back up for, yeah. for Tokyo. But I'm lucky I have a very good coach who I put my complete trust in. Yeah. So I trust him to plan everything out perfectly. But um, but yeah, it's going to be a hard, hard year of graft yeah. between training in Manchester and training abroad. But I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, it's mad to think that 2016 was like your first Olympics, wasn't it? Like it was, wasn't it? Yeah. And then obviously you um, you just missed out on on the final, which which must have been a heartbreaking thing. So do you park all that when you're when you're thinking about the next thing? Do you bring in like past performances or anything like that, or, or do you? Just go nah, like this is this is the year. Totally this is thing. this is when it's gonna happen. Um, I think you'd be foolish not to remember the past yeah. and take take the positives and learn from the negatives mm. off it. Anybody who doesn't do that, I think, needs to needs to reevaluate a little bit. Yeah. So I know that in the past there in, in Rio I just missed out in the final. Mm. I got through to the semi, which was which was fantastic. I didn't get the best out of myself for that championships because then I went and raced in Paris and ran a huge PB. So yeah. I knew that I was I was in good shape and I just didn't get it out on the day. So I've learned from that and I feel that this World Champs has been a huge a huge stepping stone for me. That's my first global final. Yeah. So that's where I want to be. Hopefully there and I am 10th. That's that's my marker. I want to improve on that. So yeah, I constantly do look back. I take strength from it and I don't spend my whole time looking backwards. Yeah. I also have to look forward. Um, so yeah, but I'll learn from the past and I'll bring all that experience into the prep for Tokyo. And it's the sub four group that you're aiming for. That's like, I mean, you've got this PB, you've literally had it for what, like a couple of weeks and now we're talking about the next one that you want to get but that's is that what you're kind of driving towards oh definitely like yeah. i i start the year with specific goals that i only discuss with me and my coach yeah um and this year going sub four was one of them yeah. and i came so tantalizingly close so close so yeah i know that i'm in shape to do yeah. it that i ran 401 in my first round the semi-final out there was slow but i mm. went out and around four flat 0.15 yeah. in the final i know that in if I was just given an individual race perfectly paced, I could went sub four. Yeah, that's an exciting place to be. It, it's a little carrot dangling in front of my head. So, um, so yeah, going out next year, that's where I want to be. I know I'm capable of it, and I feel that I've made such improvements over the past two years working with Steve and my team in New, in New Balance Manchester that this next year we'll hopefully see those improvements yeah. uh, increase. So before I let you go, one final question. You, you you brought us through your training week there and it was Monday through Sunday. I noticed that there wasn't any necessary, there were, there were lesser 
strenuous days, but there didn't seem to be like a day off. So what would be your ideal, completely no running, just rest day? I don't know if you even have those. I mean, I'm, I'm sure running would be. Oh, yeah, but like I do. I do your, points. What would be like your perfect rainy day rest day? Like we're talking, is it Netflix and PJs? Is it wine and chocolate? Just give it oh, to us. Oh, my perfect one. I'm not, I'm not much of a wine girl. I don't really drink very much. Um, but I love, understandable. I love a cup of tea <laughs> yeah. and some biscuits so for me if I could have it perfectly I would have a lovely chill day with my boyfriend probably I don't get to see him very often because I'm in Manchester yeah. and he's in Dublin um, but that would be lovely curled up on the sofa under a duvet cup of tea couple of biscuits and uh, yeah just watching he wouldn't enjoy it but just rom-coms or some <laughs> chick flick on, on the TV that would be me perfectly on a rainy day nice. Um on another day, I'd be out eating lunch because I hate making my own food. So I love a wee meal out. So I'd be out having some food out. If my, my little sister is studying in Liverpool, she comes up to visit me. I absolutely love it because I'm like, oh, an excuse to go out for lunch. So, yeah. yeah. So they're my perfect little rest days, having either one of my siblings over or my boyfriend over, just chilling and relaxing. And yeah, I need to rest because the next day is going to be a busy one. <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking that. We'll let you go. Maybe you can rest for the rest of the afternoon. But Kieran McGean, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for coming in. Thanks so in. much for having me.